This is the Kofer Books AuthorCast. Nyland McBain, a lifelong Mormon, grew up in New York City and attended Yale University. As a writer, Nyland has been published in Newsweek, Meridian Magazine, Dialogue, BustedHalo.com, The Washington Post's On Faith Religion blog, among many others. In 2010, she founded the Mormon Women Project, a digital library of interviews with LDS women from around the world, in an effort to emphasize the many ways that modern faithful women engage their religion. Nyland's book, Women at Church, Magnifying LDS Women's Local Impact, is a practical and faithful guide to improving the way men and women work together at church. Looking at current administrative and cultural practices, the author explains why some women struggle with the gender divisions of labor. She then examines real-life examples in local church settings around the country that expand and reimagine gendered practices. Women at Church has been praised as a monumental piece of work and a remarkable resource that belongs in every Latter-day Saint home. In this episode, I will be interviewing Nyland McBain. Welcome, Nyland, to the Coford AuthorCast, and thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Before we discuss women at church, why don't you give us a little background on yourself? You grew up in New York and attended school at Yale. So how did you become involved in Mormon women's studies? I did. Well, I'll, I'll give you the, um, the short answer, but even for the short answer, I have to go back to my childhood. Uh, I was raised by um, a professional mother who um, was also the mother of an only child. That was me. And so we had a kind of unconventional Mormon family situation. My father was uh, baptized, but never really active in the church, although he was very supportive. And um, so I always always had this example of my my mother, and she herself was was praised and used and embraced um, by uh, both members and leadership in terms of her ability to really move people and bring the spirit to a group through her singing and, and through her professional world and her professional experiences. And so um, I really didn't experience any disconnect myself uh, as a Mormon woman growing up because I was just surrounded by women like by surrounded by her and women like her uh, growing up in Manhattan in the 80s and 90s. Um, once I once I left New York and went to Yale for college and then moved to San Francisco and Boston and back to New York and now in Salt Lake, um, I've had various experiences as an adult that have uh, shown me that um, we either are um, not doing a good job at uh, really um, encouraging our women and fostering a, a wide range of growth opportunities for our women, um, meaning that we we tend to be uh, proposing that the priorities and the lifestyle that are important to us as members of the church are really the only thing that that women can embrace in order to be faithful and successful um, in their lives. And I, I saw time and time again that women felt like there was really only one definition of what they could do to be a faithful Mormon woman. And that, of course, had been totally not my experience. And so I kind of set, set up myself to the task of um, disavowing people of that belief and instead positioning our um, our our faith and our doctrine and our priorities as simply one component or one element, a necessary but simply one element of um, a woman's crafting of her identity. And um, that was the beginning of the Mormon Women Project. And from there, I received some speaking invitations, writing invitations. Um, I do love writing. I was an English major in college, and it's kind of just taken off from there. Now, you launched the Mormon Women Project in what year? Um, January of 2010, so it's almost six years old. And you manage the website mormonwomen.com. I do. Tell us a little bit more about that project. Uh, so it started off uh, in January 2010. I uh, posted 18 interviews that I had done myself, most of uh, which were pro- profiles of women in my own network. I had I had gone out of my own network at some point, um, even with those initial 18, but probably at least half of them were women that I grew up with or knew or was related to, and um, stories that I felt like had really shaped me as a Mormon woman coming to this um 
realization that my membership in the church and my faith really um, didn't have to dictate everything that I was as a Mormon woman, that I could, it could be a both and um, model instead of just an either or model. I could either be a more righteous Mormon woman or a not righteous woman. Um, and these were stories of, of women who I felt like embodied more of a both and mentality. I was both a more righteous Mormon woman and a someone of their own crafting. Um, and so I launched with 18 and it, it became apparent very quickly that this was that I kind of hit a nerve. Um, and so I started bringing on volunteers to do the, um, the interviews as well as myself. And so we, for the first four years of the, um, project's existence, we actually published one interview a week. So we, we have about 350 interviews on the site now and from 22 different countries, all walks of life. We did special reports on, um, uh, eating disorders and sexual abuse and adoption and gay members. And just, we really didn't let anything stop us from representing the breadth, the diversity of our, our, our sisters today in the church. And it was, it was, it's absolutely wonderful. And we are still publishing. However, um, our, our frequency isn't what it used to be. Uh, that, and that's simply my fault because I've been distracted by some of the other commitments that have come up with the writing of the book and the speaking and all of that. But it's been an incredible platform and an amazing resource. Um, I'll also mention that a couple of years ago, uh, we spun off sort of a sister brand called Our Cooperative Ministry. And this brand is run by um, two great volunteers who have um, taken upon themselves to create weekly Sunday school supplements. One of the things I talk a lot about in the book, Women at Church, is the need for us to have um, role models in our Sunday experiences, in our in our Sunday classes, um, particularly in Sunday school and Relief Society, that actually um, give women examples of the kinds of um, mentors that we have in our scriptures and in our history and even among our own membership body today. And so what these women have done with our cooperative ministry is they've created supplements that take the Sunday school lesson assignment for each week and sort of offer commentary from a, from a, a female scriptorian point of view. And they also include quotes from um, past female general officers, current female general officers, and also quotes from our interviews from the Mormon Women Project that go along with the themes of the lesson. And the purpose is that teachers can use these um to bring in the voices of women and the experiences of women into lessons that are almost exclusively male focused. Uh, also in our cooperative ministry, they're, they're doing lots of, lots of great things, but even just this morning, they held a um, live webcast with the authors of the new book, Girls Who Choose God, the Book of Mormon edition, um, MacArthur Krishna and Bethany Brady Spalding. So um, all of that is part of the Mormon Women Project now. And if I could actually just put a plug in, we have a Kickstarter campaign going for bringing those two brands together. Um, we haven't done anything to the site in six years since it's launched. So at this point, it's a little band-aided <laughs> and it needs a little renovation and TLC. So we have a Kickstarter project going for about a next um, another week to raise the funds to um, make it br bring it into a new era. And where can we find out information about the Kickstarter campaign? Um, it's on our Facebook page, but if you go to Kickstarter and search Mormon Women Project, you'll be able to find it. Perfect. And I'll put a link up for that as well. Oh, I appreciate well. that. Thank you. Yeah. So getting to women at church, uh, it seems to be largely focused on pragmatic solutions to gender imbalance within the LDS church. In many ways, it seems like a handbook of solutions that can be implemented without changing the doctrine of the church. Uh, tell me, how do you hope that your book is going to be used by readers? Um, I, I hope that it is going to be used just, just the way that you, well, it has, it has two purposes, really. I hope it's used just the way that you described it. And, and there's, there's lots of evidence to say that it is in the hands of decision making leaders, both male and female, um, who are really trying out some of the, these ideas and really taking to heart the idea that we need to be active and creative stewards of those under our, um, under our leadership. And, um, and a lot of people have given the book to their bishops and Relief Society presidents uh, for that purpose. But it also has another purpose, and um, that is really to increase the level of empathy and understanding and sort of um, 
uh, open communication between people who may feel like um, gender issues in the church are a big deal for them and those who actually don't understand what all the fuss is about. And so I really hope that the book um, is kind of a bridge uh, for those groups. And I've had a lot of evidence of people saying that it's working that way too. You know, people for whom this is a big, a big issue and a real, um, uh, real, you know, uh, a painful part of their membership in the church have given it to family members and friends who might not totally understand where they're coming from. And that's a really important purpose for the book. It's, I hope that it takes a very um, faith-based approach to introduce with empathy some of the, um, some of the practices and the behaviors and the um, um, sort of points of view that are giving uh, some people a struggle uh, with our gender issue uh, um, sort of positioning in the church. And you spend a considerable amount of time in the first half of women at church, really legitimizing the pain that some women feel uh, regarding their relationship with the church. In chapter four, you discuss six contributing factors to their struggles. Can you briefly uh, comment on some of those struggles that you mentioned? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the things that I hoped to do was was um, was really take a look at the fact that we in the church are um, we're very pragmatic people. We're people that live in the world. You know, we we don't encourage our people to sort of siphon themselves off from society or from from business or school or um, and and for those reasons, uh, I thought it was really important to sort of show the tension of where our current practices are coming up against some of the um, modern policies in our, in contemporary America, at least. Um, so for instance, one of those, which, which may feel quite obvious to people is the rise of single sisters in the church. Um, we, you know, we are a family, family church. We preach family. We are structured to support the family. And yet 60% of our women um, are not, are not currently married. Um, and so, so what does that mean when they're living in a patriarchal organization and developing talents and skills and, and um, careers um, and knowledge bases outside of the church, um, but but you know are are then when they're participating in church uh, put into a patriarchal um, uh, leadership structure. And what kind of effect does that have on them and how can we be more sensitive to that? Another one um, that I talk about is just the importance of visual role models in this day and age of social media. I give the example of, um, you know, young women, um, teens, my own, my own daughter who follows on Instagram some of her mentors and some of her, um, the role models that, that she admires. And these can, this can be everybody from, an author that she likes to Beyonce to Hillary Clinton to, you know, I mean, anybody. And, um, we do not do a good job in the church today of putting forward the, um, female leaders who really allow our girls to see what they can be. And, uh, we need to do better at that. And because our girls are not seeing women that they admire and who are leading and who are public figures in the church, they don't, they turn to other role models um, who are, uh, you know, much more forward in um, a much more uh, forward presence in their lives, really, because they are being seen and they're being heard. And these girls can um, can identify with them. And and uh, so, you know, because because we are not doing that as well in the church, um of women in the church can feel and seem invisible. And uh, that's a big struggle for a lot of people. Another thing that I talk about is our use of the word equality. So um, equality means something very specific in our um, external institutions. It means that men and women have the same opportunities to aspire to the same responsibilities and position of leadership, the same um, uh, compensation in every form, monetary and, and, and intangible, uh, and that there really is, um, this, this no breakdown of these, um, 
of these roles that we like to talk about so much in the church. And so I just, I highlight this idea that when we talk about equality in the church, when we say men and women are equal, um, we actually are, are saying something very different than the world, world is hearing. And honestly, that our youth are hearing. And it seems disingenuous because it's not appealing to the same definition that the world uses to describe men and women's equal um, value in, in society's eyes. And um, so I talk about how our use of the word equality is not, um, it doesn't have as absolute mathematical pers- sort of um, value as it does in, in the world's definition. And I, it means more that um, there are partnerships in which um, both members have, um, have, have responsibilities and um, a sort of job to balance with each other. Um, and that's not really a definition that um, external institutions, you know, sort of wrestle with very often or even comfortable with. And I think being more aware of how the church and the world sort of talk past each other on this specific word and this specific issue um, will help us understand why some women at, in our church find it disingenuous when we talk about men and women being equal. In the last half of the book, you offer fairly straightforward ideas that can be implemented at the local level to decrease gender imbalance. You assert that there's more flexibility in the scaffolding than we may think. What are a few practical ideas that you suggest that could be implemented today without requiring a churchwide change in policy or doctrine? Well, happily, I can tell you about a couple of things that have been happening in my own ward um, that have really been impactful for me and for my daughters uh, and for the other women in the ward as well. Uh, for the past two Sundays, um, and I think it was coincidental that they were kind of just in a row, but for the past two Sundays, we've had women close our sacrament meetings. Um, it's interesting, the, um, the, the first Sunday... Um, it was because we had the stake relief society president and one of her counselors, uh, come and speak in the, as the high council speaker for the month. And, um, I had been having a conversation with a couple of people, including my daughter the night before in which I kind of rhetorically asked, like, can you name your stake relief society president? Do you know, know who she is? Do you know what she looks like? Um, and, and these sort of very experienced church members that shook their heads and said, really, no, with a few exceptions, they really didn't know who their stake relief society president was. Um, and my daughter too, and that really stuck with her. She's like, yeah, I want to know who she is. Well, lo and behold, the next morning she came and gave an absolute powerhouse talk. It was fantastic. Um, and she spoke with one of her counselors who was also fantastic. Um, actually her talk was how she had, um, had really had to study the issue of polygamy and come to a peace with it. And she, it was just, it was just wonderful. And it was really meaningful for my, for my daughter specifically, because she felt like that was kind of, you know, maybe not such a coincidence that she had just um, asked about this and then this had happened. So, you know, the, the, on the other hand, um, I did hear a story recently about um, a single woman, you know, who has a thriving career, who asked her bishop if she could sort of not take the youth speaker role <laughs> in her sacrament meeting, but actually speak last, um, because inevitably single women get, get put in that kind of five minute slot at the beginning, you know, um, and and her bishop said no because. Um, he felt that um, the last speaker needed to be very experienced in adapting their talk to fit a certain time frame. And, you know, that was painful for her because she's an accomplished professional and, and felt that he wasn't expressing trust in her. Um, So I, we see a lot of sort of different um, reactions to this idea of, of mixing up the sort of quintessential woman's place in sacrament meeting where she, she's the sort of lead in or the youth speaker um, for, you know, the then doctrinal authority of her husband. Um, but in my word, it's worked out beautifully. And again, last Sunday, we just had a couple spoke, but she spoke last and, um, it was quite lovely. So I was also talking to my Bishop, um, this Sunday because he was asking me, he said, you know, we've got all of these, we've got a bunch of um, young women who are going into Relief Society and, um, graduating. And he said, I don't, you know, what should I do for them? My own daughter actually turned 12 last week. And I, I was telling him, I said, Hey, Bishop, if you want to do something special for the young women, um, for the girls, as they turn 12, this is what I did for my daughter. And I, I told him I put a whole little collection together of, um, 
his, history of the Relief Society and um, was going to talk to her about the um, the importance of the Relief Society and the Young Women's Program and what she was going. Anyway, we tried to make it kind of formal and a big deal for her. Um, so I was telling him about that. And he said, well, what should we do for the young women that are going into Relief Society? And and I said, well, think about it. The fact that, that none of these women has ever set foot in the Relief Society room before. They don't know the women in Relief Society beyond maybe their mothers and some of their mother's friends. Contrast that with the boys' experience of going to priesthood every week from the time they're 12, participating with their dads um, and brothers and maybe some other older men in very um, action-oriented service opportunities, you know, not just passing the sacrament, but um, home teaching and collecting fast offerings and, you know, cleaning the church or whatever it is that the that the young men do in your ward. My in my word, the young men pass the microphone to the elderly people who don't want to come up to the stand for testimony meeting. You know, there's all these sort of jobs that we give the young men, and um, and they're they're incorporated with the experience of the larger priesthood quorums. Um, so I I challenged my bishop. I just look like, you know, if you if you can first of all get the young women interacting with the Relief Society more, and I talk about this in the book. I have a case study. I think about how um, the young women are going visiting teaching with some of the Relief Society sisters um, in some stakes that, I've, that I'm aware of. And this gets them familiar with the process of visiting teaching, the idea that they have a job to do, they have a work to do. Um, it gets them familiar with the older women in their ward, so they're not complete strangers when they walk into Relief Society that first day. And then the other thing I suggested was, hey, you know, we've got a really large age range of women in our Relief Society. You guys have high priest group and you have elders quorum, right? Why don't we just kind of informally, maybe once, twice, three times a month, have a sort of empty nesters Relief Society lesson and then have a Relief Society lesson for the mothers of the young children and just see what happens. See what happens when you put them into different groups and let them talk with peop- with the women who are at their own life stage rather than clumping us all together every week, week after week. Um, it's not happening for the men and it shouldn't happen for the women either. So... Those are the those are the kinds of ideas that I, I explore in the second half of the book. And again, that's just sort of one snapshot in in what I'm talking about with my bishop right now. But um, there are lots and lots of things. If we open our eyes um, to the, these kinds of things, there are so many things we could do. And fortunately, the church leadership is setting a good example um, in some of these areas. For instance, taking all of the wives of the general author of the Twelve Quorum of the Twelve Apostles' Wives um, up to the stand at General Conference, so we can see them. That happened about last year. Um, female general officers were moved to the center of the um, of the the chairs uh, behind the the podium at General Conference. We have the the pictures of the female general officers up in the co- conference center. What what are we doing on our local levels to make sure that our local female leaders are just as visible? Um, just as prominent and just as easily seen by our girls and women as these general female officers are now um, during their general conference experience and 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 in the um, in the photographs that we present of them. We have a long way to go. I have a great story about a woman who tried to look for pictures of the general primary presidency at the distribution center so that she could put them up in her primary room that she was the president of and she couldn't find anything (laughs) and she finally just sort of printed thumbnails off the web and made her own um but you know when she got those up the kids noticed and they said who are those women you know they have pictures of the the first presidency and the quorum of the 12 apostles all over the primary room president monson and these kids were just like who are those women and the primary president said, you know, these are the ladies who are got, who are leading you right now. They're leading us as your teachers. And that was um, an impactful thing for the kids. So I could go on, but that's probably enough for um, for one sitting of the kinds of things that we can think about and be aware of. You know, and a lot of these things seem really kind of like a no brainer. They seem like if a if a leader was to read uh, these suggestions, they would probably say, well, these are these are reasonable and these are doable and perhaps even wonder why they hadn't thought of these things before. Sometimes it just takes somebody to uh, to really kind of make uh, make them known and and to collect them together and in one place so that people can uh, read it and, and, and think about it and pray about it. Uh, let me just finish with a final question. Uh, Michael Otterson from the Church Public Relations Department recently mentioned at a conference that gender issues are a really big topic right now uh, with the church leaders. Do you feel that you're seeing an active attempt to provide greater space for women? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and 
you know, it's interesting that you, that you say that so many of these ideas in the book are no brainers. Um, you know, it's, it's sobering to actually witness, um, how challenging the book has been for many people, challenging to their sense of identity and a, particularly for women. Um, this is always something that, that, uh, startles me when I talk to people or do presentations is that, um, I receive much more positive feedback from men than for women. And it puzzled me a lot when I first started noticing this. The questions are always from men and people who come up to me afterwards and thank me for coming and talking are men. The people that line up to buy the book are men. And I, I really felt like it really came, it took me a while to come to terms with the idea that, you know, when we're suggesting all these changes and when, when Elder Nelson gets up and says, you know, women, we, we need to hear your voice. This is, this is actually a bigger, um, cultural shift than I think sort of we, uh, that might be closer to sort of a millennial generation might give credit to. And so that's one reason that I've been so grateful that I can point to some things that the, the general leadership is doing on this front to really emphasize the fact that we need to do better. Gender is obviously an important part of our doctrine. We talk about it a lot. But at the end of the day, we live in a um, organization in which offices of administration are almost exclusively held by men. And so seeing our, you know, the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, President Nelson, really wrestling with, with what this means to have women's participation in environments that are led by men, I think is a really telling thing for us as a people that we too need to be struggling with. What does this mean? How can I do better? You know, what, um, what should I be, how should I arm my daughters so that they can function both in a world in which, you know, equality and in the worldly sense of aspiring to every opportunity is celebrated alongside with the gendered priesthood office um, structure that we currently have. How do we ask our girls to walk that walk and walk that line? And I think that, that the example of our general leaders in talking about it in general conference, in making these small changes, but the way that they present the female general officers, the, the optics of general conference, the optics in the, in the ensign, these small things for me are evidence that, that you know, our leaders want us to take this conversation seriously. And it's, um, it's something that if we, you know, are following the examples of our general leaders, that the membership too needs to be wrestling with. Well, it seems like we're heading down a good path and I sincerely hope that we continue marching this way. And I sincerely appreciate the work that you and many other uh, scholars and uh, women leaders are putting forth to really make your voices heard and in sharing these these wonderful ideas in keeping with a true spirit of fellowship uh, within the church. Thank you, Nylan, for being our guest today. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you having me. That was Nylan McBain, author of Women at Church, Magnifying LDS Women's Local Impact, published in 2014 by Greg Coford Books and available in paperback and ebook. Thank you for listening to the Coford Books AuthorCast. Please be sure to subscribe and rate us on iTunes, and also like our Facebook page for regular updates.